Namaste. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last class this course uh, for this semester. Uh, last week, I mean, on Monday, we had special class, so uh, we were looking at uh, chapter nine, uh, money, and uh, we saw that money is one of the challenges that uh, you know uh, all of us face in every sphere of life. But if our weakness is money, uh, you know, is one area where Satan can easily uh, tempt us and target us and bring our downfall. So, you know, uh, many men and women of God have, um, you know, fallen, uh, have lost their sense of purpose and calling, integrity in their uh, ministry. One area is money. What do you think is the other area? What are the two main challenges in Christian ministry that any uh, men and women face and where there is a downfall? Fellowship? One is money, second is? Women, yes. For men it's women, for, for women it is men. It's it's either adultery, uh, extramarital affair. So these are the two areas where we need to keep on guard. One is money and the next chapter we'll be looking at is women. And for those of us who are women, it's it's men. Uh, so we need to look at this very, very seriously, guard ourselves, protect ourselves, and do everything that is needed uh, so that if these are one of our weak points or areas, you know, Satan can easily uh, target us. Okay, so we started looking at, um, at the area of uh, finances or money. Uh, we are looking at some of the areas where we need to hold ourselves accountable, integrity, watch over our lives, guard over our lives. Uh, so we spoke of various areas. We'll just look at a few more and then we'll continue on. The other thing is in Christian ministry, you know, uh, we always look for uh, funds, right? Whether other churches, uh, maybe it's a, it's a village churches that are looking for, uh, you know, support from uh, churches in the city or there are uh, churches in the city or organizations in our city that's looking for foreign funding. And uh, it's okay, you know, sometimes we can ask for uh, foreign funding. But, um, you know, uh, we believe that India has, is, a, is a rich country, right? We have wealth resources within our country to support one another in the Christian organizations, churches, uh, to support other Christian uh, ministries. Uh, but also we, there are times when we would need, you know, uh, extra help, financial help. Uh, but in, in when you're looking for help, there is some areas where you have to, you know, be honest and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, not cheat or um, people who are supporting you. One area is, you know, it's often seen that when you ask for support for a specific uh, project, you know, you can ask uh, two or three sponsors to sponsor you. So sometimes if one sponsor is just uh, uh, sponsoring half of it, then you can look for somebody who's going to sponsor the rest of it. So it's okay. But sometimes, you know, uh, you get full sponsorship from one or two donors. But then you still keep on asking other donors. So you'll have about three or four people who maybe are supporting you, giving you full sponsorship or full support. Um, uh, and that way you are cheating the organization, right? So suppose if one organization is giving you full support, should you look for support from other organizations as well to support you or other people to support you? No, because you've already received the full support. But what some Christian organizations and churches do is even though they get full support for one specific project uh, from one donor or one sponsor, they also, you know, uh, if others are willing to support, they take finances from us. So that is cheating, that is theft, uh, you know, and that is not what is, uh, you know, what God uh, would require of us. That is not being honest and transparent uh, and having integrity in the area of finances. So, uh, you know, in the area of finances, we need to be clean, transparent, and honest, uh, you know, with those who are providing financial um, support. Okay, the next thing we need to do is, um, you know, sometimes when we're getting funds for a specific project, we can use that funds, uh, maybe that fund, uh, the project is running on a very low budget, okay? And you've got extra money. Uh, so what do you do sometimes? Sometimes you use that money for something else, right? For some other project. But if you want to use it for some other project, uh, do you think it's right to use it for some other project? 
one donor is suppose one donor is giving you uh, finances to raise a Bible college, okay, and you have extra surplus amount of money. So you want to start, uh, uh, you just say maybe you want to start um, uh, a small orphanage, okay? Can you use this money into that orphanage? Yes, no? Yes, no? Yes, you, if you want to use it, then you have to ask the donor's permission. Once you have get the for donor's permission, there is something else you need to do. You need to also get legal permission. See, you can't use uh, funds that are coming for one project. You can, can't use it. Uh, it's illegal. You'll have to even get legal uh, permission uh, uh, to do that. So you can't divert the funds uh, as in how you want. You need to get the donor's permission. The donor says, okay, then you'll have to be accountable and transparent to him the way that you're using that money. How much you're using for uh you know bible college how much you're using for the orphanage but sometimes you know you're getting money for just say you started an orphanage okay and also you want uh, uh, you know you you are sent a calling to be an evangelist okay so you're running an orphanage and also you have a calling to be an evangelist so you use that can you use that money which you receive from your donor uh, for running an orphanage can you use it for evangelistic purposes for evangelistic crusades can you use it for your evangelistic crusades? No, sometimes you can justify saying, uh, you know, in the evangelistic crusades, the orphanage children actually were part, they were actually singing in the choir. So it's actually the involvement of the orphanage. So it's part of the orphanage. You can't say that, right? You can't use that funds that was given for the orphanage for the evangelistic crusade. If you want to use it, you have to get the donor's permission, also get the legal permission. And it's, if you're doing that without getting legal permission and the donor's permission, then what you're doing is basically wrong. You can't justify by saying that I'm doing the evangelistic crusade, but even in my evangelistic crusades, I'm having all of the children, you know, sing in the choir. That is not right. Okay. So um, we need to be transparent and we need to do what is ethically and morally right. Okay. Uh, the next thing is don't rob overseas ministers you know there are many overseas uh, people in various uh, uh, you know organizations churches they want to come and minister in asia so they look at india they want to come and have crusades or they want to have a uh, you know music festival uh, they want to have a you know a seminar on different topics and uh, many of our uh, indian ministers or so-called christian organizations um, they're very willing to, you know, organize the whole show, okay? But in the in the process of organizing that whole show, you know, they kind of, um, you know, don't present the actual costs. Now, suppose the whole cost for hiring a uh, sound system can be about two or three lakhs. Uh, they will say it's about four or four, four or five lakhs. And they will justify it saying, anyway, you know, when they're, they're coming from the U.S., so it's dollars, and you, you know, you convert that currency in Indian money, it's 80 rupees, uh, yeah, $1 is 80 rupees. So, you know, they are not going to be spending so much. Uh, so even if you put extra cost, you know, uh, or charge them not the actual cost, extra cost, then, you know, we can keep that money to run our own ministry organization. Or after they go, we can do follow up. With them. Now, what do you think? Is that right to do? No, we need to present the actual cost to and if you want to do a follow-up of the evangelistic crusade or the music ministry or whatever they have done, then you can say, you know, we like to do a follow-up. Is it okay with you? And then, you know, then they'll say, it's fine. You can just let us know the expenses, you know, present the expenses. But in most, in many cases, it's very sad that, you know, um, uh, usually, um, you know, Christian ministries, Christian organizations who organize events for overseas preachers and ministers, and Christian organizations, they usually exploit them and cheat them, and that is wrong, okay? So uh, when we do that, you know, we become a liar and a thief, and that's not what God wants us to uh, do. Look at what Paul tells us, um, warns us in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Can somebody read Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, please? It's given in italics, or you can read it from your Bible, in your notes. We are on the point to not divert funds from one project to another without donor's permission. 
Uh, sorry, do not drop overseas ministers. Can one of you please read? For, ma for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Yes. So you look at what Paul is uh, saying, you know, those who are greedy, uh, looking for money to feed their own belly means, you know, their own carnal nature, their own fleshly nature, and they're setting their minds on earthly things. What happens to such people? They are enemies of the cross of Christ. And what is the end of such people? Destruction. Okay. And the other thing we need to uh, hold ourselves uh, accountable or you know, have integrity or guard ourselves uh, when we are handling finances when it comes to ministry is don't mix uh, the money or the income that comes in um, uh, through ministry for personal business okay so baby you know uh, you, uh, you started a church and uh, you know the church is not uh, uh, you know running uh, well you need more finances so you're thinking, okay, if I have to do so many things, if I want to start a Bible college, if I want to start an orphanage, or if I want to start a school, then I need to have more finances. And from the tight money and what people are giving, you know, this it's not going to suffice. I need more money. So why don't I uh, do a small business, start a small business? So to start a small business, you say, anyway, I'm going to, uh, you know, I will use the uh, tight money, the finances of the church. And anyway, I'm going to use it to multiply and when I'm going to start a Bible college or an orphanage, it's all part of this church-related ministry. So it's okay for me to use, uh, you know, um, the tight money. What do you think? Is that the right way of thinking? Yes, no? No, it's not the right way of thinking. What if you, uh, you know, if you use that money, the tight money, and you start an orphanage or you start a Bible college, and, you know, it, it, does, not, it does not work? You know, it does not uh, flourish. You know, you have to close it down. Then what happens is, you know, you have wasted the money uh, and people who have uh, given as tithe, who have, you know, given into the work of the Lord or, uh, you know, given the money uh, as offering in the church, they will be very cheated, let down, disappointed, uh, you know. So it's, it's important that even if the members agree, uh, you have to manage the finances. You're starting an orphanage separately. Bible call it separately, and what type money comes in uh, separately, okay? Some ministers, what they do is they invest the money that comes as tithe and offering. They put it in some in different investments so that it can multiply. And they say, you know, uh, this is what Jesus taught us in the parable, that we have to multiply the money. He's looking for multiplication. He's looking for us to, uh, you know, uh, be productive in what he's given to us. But that is in the area of our talents and the gifts that he's given to us and also being good steward of the resources but you know if you're going to invest what if that investment fails that investment policy fails what if it doesn't come through what if it does not multiply then you know the, the church members are very disappointed people can leave the church they can feel cheated uh, they can feel let down and some people even uh, you know um, uh, they go away from God just because of you know a small mistake that the minister or the man or woman of God has uh, done. So we need to be very careful in that area. Um, you know, if the Lord is leading you to start a school or you to start a university or college or some, uh, you know, Bible college or a training ministry, whatever, it's important that you handle the management. The management and the financials should be separate from the church-related accounts and the ministry. Uh, the other thing we need to do is uh, be careful when you enter into a business venture with different members in your church. Now, a, a member in your church or a good friend of them, you know, uh, they're starting a business and you think it's a good business and you also want to invest. If you want to invest, you do that separately from the church. You don't use the church type money. You use your own finances to invest in the business. But if you're investing in a business, you need to be very, very careful because sometimes what happens if the business fails then you know what happens to the relationships the relations go sour right you you get disappointed with each other you get angry with each other 
and uh, what happens is the other person can um, leave the church or he can be in the church and cause a division and talk bad about the minister of God, the pastor, and say, because of the pastor, I lost my money, I lost my business, because the person will not be willing to see their own faults and their own mistakes. They'll not take it upon themselves. So if you want to get into a business venture with somebody in the ministry, in your church, in your organization, then you need to be very, very um, clear, uh, you know, uh, clear about it. You need to be very careful what you're entering into, what you're doing it, what you're doing, and do it with the spirits leading and uh, guidance. Okay. Um, the next thing we need to remember is the house of God is not a place to do business. Okay. Uh, remember what Jesus did in in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 14. When he came to the temple, what did Jesus do when he came to the temple? What did he see? Use the mic. Huh? Yeah, the people were selling, uh, you know, uh, the outer courts, which was a place for the Gentiles. You know, they were using the outer court as a marketplace. Yeah, and they were, ju they were justifying themselves. You know, people are traveling all the way from such far distances. They come to Jerusalem. They don't have the time to go to the market or to carry their animal for sacrifice. So when they come, it's just easy, accessible in the Gentile court. But Jesus was very angry. First reason was because of the Gentile court. Now, if there is a market happening in the Gentile court, how will the Gentiles worship? Oh, how can they concentrate with all the noise and the dust and the uh, confusion? So, you know, they were treating the Gentiles, uh, you know, they were not valuing them that they are coming there to worship. The second thing, uh, why do you think Jesus, uh, you know, what did he, when, when Jesus saw this, what did he do? He turned the tables, he took a whip and he drove everybody away, you know, turned the money tables. Why did he do that? Why was he so aggressive and angry? God's house is not a house for business. God's house is a house for prayer. They were, make it, uh, they were making God's house as a business place. Okay. But the, the other reason why God, Jesus was so angry with them was because they were actually, you know, fleecing the people. They were actually cheating the people. So if a, a, a bird for sacrifice was just say 10 rupees, I'm just saying it is, you know, uh, 10 rupees, they would charge them 15 rupees or even 20 rupees. Because they won't know the price, they can't bargain with them, they can't go to the market, you know, it's, a, it's an extra burden for them, so they would just buy. And so they were cheating poor people, rich people, or any people who were coming to sacrifice in the house of, of God. So that was another third reason that why Jesus, you know, was so angry and he, uh, you know, he reacted uh, that way. So, you know, we don't usually make uh, the house of God a business place. We don't see people, you know, selling things. But, uh, you know, sometimes we can with, um, you know, with uh, uh, some pastors, they record their messages and the tapes. Now, the, they just spend about 25 rupees. If they charge 50 rupees, it's okay. You know, sometimes they can charge 200 rupees, 250, you know. Uh, uh, you know, suppose a book just cost them about uh, the total cost of the book to say, Costed them about 150 or 200 rupees of print. They want to make a business, say 100 rupees, so 300 rupees they can charge. They'll charge like 500 or 600, and they force the church members to buy a copy. Everyone has to buy a copy. And that is basically cheating. Yes, you can make a little, you know, margin of what you're selling, but don't make the house of God a place of merchandise, a business where you are selling and where you're cheating people and you're taking extra from uh, them, okay? Uh, another important area uh, when it comes to the aspect of money is we need to guard ourselves against greed. Now, when we enter into ministry, you know, uh, you know, we'll enter in a very pure heart, very clean, we're satisfied with what money we're getting. But as time goes on, you know, uh, we want more finances. You know, uh, we're not satisfied with what offerings we receive, tithes we receive. So we demand from people. They demand people to give. And sometimes people don't like to go to church. I, I, have, uh, I have heard people because they, every Sunday when we go, Pastor will talk about, you know, uh, we remind us about giving for the building fund. Just now we give care for the building fund for the renovation of the church. Now they want to build a 
uh, a hall for that. Now, again, we have to give money. Uh, and so, you know, we don't want to go to that church. We just go to some other church. Still, this whole building project is over. And then, you know, maybe if you want, we can go back. So people get fed up, you know, giving, giving. Uh, you know, they always have to be giving. It's constantly being told from the pulpit, uh, you know, to give. Uh, they're asked to give. Uh, and, you know, when people, when we do that, uh, you know, it's does not, you know, show a good, uh, it doesn't portray something good about you. Uh, it just portrays, uh, you know, that the church of uh, God, the house of God is a place where, you know, you constantly have to give, you're all asked, you just have to contribute all the time. And people are really frustrated because, you know, even in the world, they have to pay so much of money for everything. Prices are rising. You know, fees is rising for their children. There are a lot of demands. And coming to church where they're coming to worship God, where they want to just receive and be blessed and feel encouraged and renewed in the spirit again and again. You know, so people get frustrated. Uh, just present it to them and leave it. Don't keep going behind them, asking them, forcing them uh, to give. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we are so concerned about money, you know, we can get into a place where we can become greedy, that we are demanding uh, and expecting huge offering or uh, we want to get more. And sometimes we are also asking for more because the, the, the basically the minister wants to live a very lavish lifestyle, you know, wants to build a bigger house or buy a car or, you know, uh, do, you know, uh, have a lavish lifestyle. And that is wrong. You can't do that at the expense of, you know, tight money and what people are giving to the house of um, God. I remember I was in this, uh, uh, just before I joined APC, I was uh, part of this Christian organization where we started a project for, um, you know, um, uh, teens in schools. Okay. So we had to raise funds and it was two of us who were leading this project and we had to raise funds. And one thing I hate to do is ask money from anybody. Even if I don't have money, I would never ask my dad or my mom. I, mean, I don't like stretching out my hand to anybody. And that is something I just can't, I don't like. Uh, and, you know, here I had to raise money and ask people, which is something very difficult for me. So what I used to do is I just used to get email IDs of people who can sponsor. I would just send them an email, send them all the details, uh, show them what our project is, give them the brochure and everything, send the link of the brochure. That is it. I will not follow up with a WhatsApp message or the, that time there was no WhatsApp and all. I will not follow up the phone call or the, when I meet them, I will never ask them. Uh, so that, you know, when they when they see me the next time, I don't want them to run away from me saying, oh, she's coming, she's going to ask me about, you know, can we contribute? And never ask anybody, never talk about money. But what I do is I just pray. I say, God, I'm just sending this email, this letter, just speak to that person and just, you know, um, you know, uh, steer their hearts to give. And just miraculously, God used to miraculously provide for us the exact amount that we need for that project. And I feel like, you know, uh, I know that you know God does not raise us up to be beggars to ask people. Uh, this is His uh, His field. These are His people. Uh, we are just stewards. You know He is. Um, uh, uh, you know He owns the cattle on the thousand hills. He owns all the finances, the riches, the wealth. You know if it is truly His work, we just need to trust Him to provide, and He will just provide from nowhere and from anywhere. So don't uh, stretch out your hands and ask people for money. That's one area where we will let down our guard, where even Satan can um, tempt us and, you know, we don't give a good taste or a feel or uh, people will not like uh, what we are saying or what we are uh, doing. Okay. Um, the last thing that we can do is, you know, uh, uh, to keep ourselves, how can we guard ourselves from the love of money? or guard ourselves from going away into greed and being led astray into all kinds of temptations and finally bringing a downfall of our own lives, our calling, our ministry. Uh, one area is, you know, to uh, keep ourselves accountable with the money that we have, you know, uh, uh, keep our finances transparent. Uh, in APC, you know, um, the finances are so transparent at the end of the year, the whole year's expenses are made available to the members. Anyone at any point of time can question, can raise up things. They can go look at what money has come in, what has been, uh, you know, what expenditure uh, has taken place in di different um, uh, 
ministry areas, how much has been spent, why so much has been spent. People can ask and, you know, um, there is the, the finances are very, very transparent. That is what we need to do. Second thing is we need to guard ourselves, you know, the word of God, uh, you know, um, uh, keep our hearts and minds accountable, pure to God, uh, ask the Holy Spirit to, to cleanse us, to keep a check on us. The other way that, you know, we can guard ourselves against greed is contribute. You know, give into other people's lives, uh, give into other people's ministry. You, uh, you know, give into, uh, you see a, a minister of God who's struggling, uh, you know, to pay his children's fees or uh, to run his church or they don't have a PA system or a, a guitar or a, a, a drum set or a keyboard. You can just contribute money or you can just buy and give or you can, you know, contribute towards some, uh, you know, program, mission program that we have. So you can contribute to a different mission organizations. So when you give, you don't become like a lake. Sometimes we can become a lake or we can be a river. Okay, a lake is, you know, just getting water dumped in. So you're just constantly wanting money. So when you're wanting money, you know, there is more greed. You're expecting more. And then when you're expecting more, into, you can, you know, slowly go into areas where you can uh, fall into temptation. Uh, you know, greed can set in. Uh, so what you need to do is uh, don't be a lake where you're just constantly get wanting money more and more and more. And what happens to a lake when just water is coming in and there's no outlet of water, what happens? It gets contaminated, it becomes stagnant, you know, and it gets dirty. Uh, no one, it's not useful. But then be a river. You know, what is coming in, but also what is, you know, there's an outflow of, of water. Okay, so be a river that brings life to others, that enriches others, builds up others, and supports others. So when you are becoming a river, you know, um, uh, you're giving, uh, and you're also fulfilling what, uh, you know, uh, is the biblical, um, uh, you know, what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us, give and it will be given to you. Okay, give and it will be given to you. Sometimes we don't want to give out, thinking if we give out, what will we do for our own ministries? But when we give, we will experience an inflow from God. God will bless us. Okay? So there are some of those things that we need to be mindful, areas that we need to be mindful about the area of uh, money, where it's one area where many men and women of God have fallen, many churches have been destroyed, ministries have been destroyed. So we need to hold ourselves um, you know, keep guard in those in that area of finances and money, and keep ourselves accountable to the people that we are serving and who are ministering under us, and be transparent even to the government in terms of filing our income tax, and be transparent so that even government officials can take a look at our money, and um, you know, will not uh, will not say that what we're doing is not right, uh, ethically and morally not. Any questions uh, regarding chapter uh, nine? Money? Any questions? No questions? Be also very careful when you are counting uh, your offering, offering money and tithe money. You know, uh, sometimes uh, Satan can squeeze, you know, tempt us to an extent where we can slowly, you know, pocket some of that money and put it into our own pockets. Because that then it's not, you know, fully accounted. You can be counting the money, but slowly slip it into our pockets or into our bags. And it has happened. And it's a temptation where, the, you know, it's an area where Satan tempts us. Right? And we need to be very careful. Yes. Can you please take the mic? Give him the mic, please. Thank you. I heard, I heard from many pastors, they used to say like uh, for tithes. Is it okay to use the tithes for their personal uh, work? Okay, good question. Uh, many pastors use the tithe money for their own personal work. Right, what do you think? Can you use the tithe money that comes in? You're the pastor of a church. Run that church, an independent church. Or, you know, uh, you're also under 
a mainline church, but then it's an independent church that you're running. Can you use the time money for your own, uh, uh, you know, expenses, your own uh, clothes, okay? We can use the money that is allotted to us by the church. You know, the church has to have a, uh, a small committee. Uh, if there is no committee, you have to organize, you have to make a committee, especially in the area of finances, so that you're accountable to that. And you have people account for the tight money that is coming. Tight money that is coming in is accountable, uh, accounted, and so you have to show the expenses. How you have, you know, what is the expenditure for that money that is coming? And uh, you know, uh, there are some a certain amount is allocated for uh, pastors' rent, uh, their children's school fees, for their petrol, for their travel, and all of that. But if you want to take apart from that, you want to take extra. See. You, you, the church has given you one scooter, but you want a car. You still have a second-hand car. Can you buy the second-hand car with the tight money? To need that car, then you have to get the permission of the church members. Not just the committee, but the church members. Put it across the church members. Ask them if it's okay, because it's their money, it's their tight money. But actually, the tight money that comes in is not for buying our own car. It is actually for the ministry of the to use that to minister to the maybe you know uh, the, the 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 orphanages or you know poor people or you know start some small project where you can use that money so that is to build the kingdom of god that money is not for personal things and that can become a temptation and sometimes we can justify it i'm the pastor i'm working hard so you know i'm going out sometimes for house visit hospital visits in the night it's raining I need a car. You need a car, pray. God will feel the, you know, lead somebody to give you a, a car. I remember, you know, uh, being in ministry um, uh, once, um, you know, we lost one of the, uh, you know, uh, instruments. And I'm the leader. And it was, I had given it uh, the instrument for, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I asked somebody who's working under me to take care of it, to bring it and take it and go. The person has forgotten, left and gone, and uh, then realize that it's lost. But as a minister, as a leader, you know, I can't blame her and tell her you have to buy it. I have to take account. Of, I have to be accountable. So what I did was, uh, you know, I, I I told the head of the organization that I will buy that, uh, you know, instrument that is lost. It cost a lot of money. And uh, I didn't have the finances. I just prayed. No, I just prayed. I said, God, I don't have any finances. I, I'm, I'm not going to ask anybody. I can't ask anybody. It's not right. But you just somehow just provide for me. Okay. And uh, in just three days, I had two people from the team who were ministering by the team. They just sent me an email and, uh, you know, saying we would like to contribute something to uh, to buy that. So uh, I, I shared that email with the leader. And then when the leader said, okay. All three of us pulled in that money and brought, brought that, uh, you know, instrument. So God knows. He just provides. Okay. Uh, but we are very accountable to God for the money that, that comes in as uh, tight money because it's God's money. Use it for building the church and uh, for the kingdom of God. Okay. Yes. You can take the mic, please. Uh, all my students have a question. Samuel has a question. Is it okay to take money from people when we pray for them? And they will give it to us as an offering. Yes, it's okay to uh, uh, to take it as a gift. Just say thank you. Um, uh, sometimes when you when I sense uh, I don't receive like that, but then you know when you sense that 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 family itself is going through a need, then you can just say I would like to uh, thank you for this gift, but then I would like to just give it back, and you can use it, uh, you know, to pay maybe your child's fees or whatever. I would just like to give it back to you. I'd like to just bless it and give it back to you. Or sometimes you can take that money if it's a rich person, you know they have, and they're giving out of the abundance. You can take it and maybe uh, you have a need, you can use it. But if you, you know, you don't like anything, you God has blessed you, you can take it and maybe bless somebody else who is in need. You can do that. But it's not right for us to demand, saying, you know, I'm coming for hospital visit. You have to keep 1,000 rupees ready, you know, for the visit and for the petrol charges. 
that's not right. Yes. For oh, one minute, sorry, please. Did that help, Samuel? Did I answer your question? Okay, it's left the meeting. Okay, we'll. He's the only whole and soul leader, okay? So, like, uh, Yes, it is. Uh, it is right. He can. Uh, he can make a budget and say so much for house rent, so much for children's fees, so much is my salary. Um, and some uh, some churches I know they pay even for gas and electricity bill and uh, phone bill and petrol. This is the thing presented to the church. They okay with it? It's fine. Or even if you're using it because you are the leader, you're the only leader who or the only pastor assigned the church can use it. But at the end of the year, you can, you know, uh, present to the church. This is what tithes came in. This is what offerings came in. This is what donations came in. This is the expenditure that we use for various things of the church. And this is the expenditure for the pastor. And if anyone can raise up and say this is too much, you know, because this bill, that bill is too much and all that, they can question you. Don't feel, um, don't get angry. Uh, don't, uh, you know, say you have no right. They have the right to ask. And it's also good for us to be accountable. And that is one sense where we can keep ourselves in guard, in check. When we're making it transparent, anyone can question us. We have the bills, everything to show them, uh, you know. And so there, that is where we are holding ourselves accountable. We are uh, having accountability. And it will help us later on in ministry as well. It's a good thing to do. Yes, yes. And keep all the bills, everything, so you can present. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, they can use that money that comes in. And also it's important for our, the pastor to teach, you know, teach regarding how uh, the, the priest in the Old Testament, they received from the offering. It was God who gave them the, you know, the right to take what was brought in as offering, what was given to the priest. Uh, so we need to teach them and ed educate them on that. Uh, the other thing is also, yeah, I know village pastors, they can, um, they have this problem. But they can also, uh, you know, get support from, uh, you know, other mainline churches. Or they can also do some part-time job. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was in Mizoram for a year, up northeast Mizoram. And very simple people, not much of business and this and that. They, basically, they grow their own vegetables. Everything is so expensive. Um, so, you know, um, but, you know, those people, that's every uh, Sunday, they'll bring one handful of rice. And, you know, they're collecting that rice and they're actually supporting missionaries who go out of Mizoram and work in other places uh, in India. Just look at their own, their, their perspective and just imagine how God will bless that, that work. They, they themselves are not rich. They can't bring money. They're not earning. They're just bringing a handful of rice, you know. 
and that handful of guys is uh, helping them to support missionaries across India and also some of them who go overseas. So that's why I said, you know, our country is not poor, even villages. Just get them started, show them how they can build on the resources that are available and, you know, they can do very well. Okay. Any other questions? Anyone else? Ah, yes. Vimal. Finally, I got your name by the end of the semester. <laughs> yeah. Keep your mic close, please. Yeah. Thank you. So, the north, there is so many pastors, and I saw Punjab growing, and there is a pastor, but they used to do. If you want to meet them, you have to put a point of you have to pay. And if you want to video call, I can and call out. So it's totally wrong. And can we just Yes, it's totally wrong. Uh, do we judge them? Uh, we know what they're doing is wrong. Uh, so we've already in one sense we've judged, but we don't judge them in the sense of you know, we leave the judgment to God. But what we can do is just pray for them. God will open their eyes to see the truth. They will know the truth and somehow they will not do this. They'll be there to minister and serve people. Their eyes will be open to how Jesus ministered here on the earth and they will, you know, that they will be broken free from that bondage and strong. Yeah, there's a, that's a sad thing. There's even people who are in major leadership positions, even in the city of Bangalore, who are misusing church funds, you know, missionaries who have come thousands of years back and with the hard-earned money, just selling property, and there's no one raising up and, and questioning them. So it is important when we see something wrong, we pray about it, we take two or three elders, go and uh, speak to them and help them you know, see the truth and you know, correct them in a loving way. We need to do that, yes. That's what we learned, right? Last class in fellowship, we need to do that. Fellowship is not just saying hi, hello, and knowing the other Christian ministers. But fellowship is also, you know, sharing our hearts and mentoring people. And um, to a point where when they, they make a mistake, uh, the other leaders can go and, you know, correct them in a loving, in a loving way, uh, which will help them to help restore them. But if they're not willing, then, like Paul says, you lead them to Satan. Right? Not that they will be judged and condemned and be destroyed, but at least they'll come to their senses and know the wrong that they're doing and they'll correct themselves. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, we'll move to the, the next important area is women. Uh, this, uh, this lesson is basically addressed to men, but also for us women, uh, you know, parallelly we can also think and we can also learn uh, so, you know, the main challenge that anyone faces in Christian ministry or uh, two main areas is money and women. Or for, for women, it is men, okay? Where we can get into a wrong relationship, adultery, and it can become a downfall, divide the church, bring a downfall of our ministry, our reputation, our calling, uh, and all that. So that is one of, this women is also a big challenge in, in, in ministry. Uh, money and um, uh, women, uh, you know, uh, is a temptation that spares no man, okay, whether they are rich, poor, whether they are greatly anointed, many years in ministry, 40 years in ministry, this can even be an area where they can be a downfall, they can be very prayerful, anointed, uh, you know, um, whatever, but these two areas we need to keep ourselves in check and in um, God, okay. Um, you know, uh, Samson, the Bible, okay, Samson, uh, he had a calling, he had anointing, okay, he was called to be a leader, a deliverer, uh, he was anointed by God, and um, how did he lose his anointing, How what, what, what about his downfall, his love for women, okay, basically his love for women, and him constantly sleeping in the lap of Delilah, okay, was it an overnight uh, downfall? No, it was, it happened gradually and consistently, okay, but he did not heed to things, you know, and it came to a point where, um, you know, uh, it caused him to compromise uh, on his weakness and that brought his downfall 
in the very area that he was empowered uh, uh, to walk in his calling or what God called him to uh, be. And it did not happen overnight. It happened, uh, you know, over a period of time. And we know that Samson was finally blinded, right? When the Philistines caught him, they blinded, they pulled out his eyes, gouged out his eyes. Um, uh, but before he was, you know, blinded physically, he was already blinded uh, because of, uh, you know, his love for women. Um, and, uh, you know, he thought his strength, his anointing would last for ever, but he did not realize that it would bring his downfall. And, uh, you know, God withdrew from him. And what a sad ending uh, for this judge, uh, this leader who God had uh, raised. So uh, we need to be careful because, uh, you know, these temptations that come, these moral failures in the area of women or money does not come overnight. Okay, so even now you need to guard yourself against it. So how do you guard yourself against it? So even when you're talking or relating to women, whether in the workplace or in Bible college or in church, you know, don't be flirting. You know, we can be talking and joking and always being around women and we call them sisters, sisters, but, you know, we're totally only with women, only concentrating, only looking at them. You know, um, that is one area where we are building up on our weakness, okay? I'm not saying don't talk to men, don't talk to women, and women don't talk to men. But if you constantly find yourself, even we women, we're constantly finding ourselves talking and joking and relating only with men, going only around with men, then that's a weakness where we can bring our downfall, okay? So, um, you know, the other thing that we need to do is uh, when we look at posters, you know, uh, so suddenly when you're walking on the street, you look at a poster and it, it's showing a woman that is clad very, uh, you know, very, very less clothes, a lot of skin is showing. Uh, you know, suddenly when you look at it, we can turn away our, our gaze, our focus. But if we continue focusing on that, you know, uh, giving into lustful thoughts, lustful, sinful passions that brings in, you know, uh, builds up a, 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 a sequence or a movie that can just, keep playing in our mind, that is also an area where we can, you know, giving in to our weakness, where Satan can tempt us and we can, you know, our thoughts become our actions, our actions become our habits, our habits become our character. Okay, so we need to be very, very careful about it. So just a thought that comes in, something that you look, pornography, you know, or, or always you're looking at women or always looking at men, you're very excited or, you know, you know how always some people be women always hugging men or holding their hands or, you know, men doing the same thing. That is, you know, building your area of weakness and Satan can easily get so it. You a time. It's like a small trap, you know, that Satan can bring in and you can, uh, you know, can see your mind. First, it happens as a thought that comes in your mind. You think that it is harmless. Okay, I'm just thinking about her. Maybe she looks very beautiful. She looks very gorgeous. She looks very nice. So just the thought, it's okay, it's harmless. But, you know, when you keep thinking about it, it leads to acting. Then we indulge in pornography. We indulge in you know, flirting with other women or other men. And then soon these thoughts become suggestions where it becomes much more stronger and becomes like an argument or a reasoning where they're convinced, you know, we, we can do something about it. We need to act on it. And that's when, you know, we can do things that is outside the boundaries that God has set for us and can be very devastating for our lives and for the other person um, as well. So, you know, um, slowly our thoughts, imaginations and our reasoning uh, becomes a captive then we are blinded uh, by the truth and uh, our conscience also becomes dead in that area uh, so you know all that we stood for our values our morals can just come to a downfall because sometimes we think we can take control of our will you know but we need to be very careful in that area you, you cannot you know sometimes you can just give in to your will without even you knowing things can just happen okay so you need to be very, very careful and keep your boundaries, draw your lines, know where you you should not step outside your lines and boundaries that you have set for yourselves. Uh, okay. Sometimes when we, you know, we can look at, uh, you, can, you can look at beautiful woman. Is it wrong to look at a beautiful woman? 
and say, oh, wow, she looks so beautiful. She dresses so well. I really like to look at her. Is it wrong to say that? Is it wrong to look at my beauty? It's not wrong to look and admire beauty. It's not wrong for us uh, men to look at women to look at men and to admire and say, oh, he looks handsome. Or he dresses up well. But, you know, but taking it to the next level. What is the next level? We will go for our break and then we will come back and, <laughs> and meet the parents. Okay? So we'll take a break now and we'll come back. <laughs>